Hello, I'm Mary Curry and I'm with Mango Math and I'm here to do a session with you on being a math champion. I am an educator. I have taught numerous years in both regular ed and special education for grades kindergarten through up through middle school. So I've had a lot of experience with kids in a lot of different backgrounds and abilities. And I wanna share with you some ways that have worked with them and some ways that you can incorporate math in a more fun and engaging way and become a math champion yourself. So I'm gonna start with sharing my screen and we're gonna go through this little PowerPoint I have. So uh, as I said, I'm Mary Curry. I also have a master's degree in curriculum and instruction. And I have found my forte is writing math curriculum and I've written my own math curriculum and you can check it out. It's called uh, Mango Math. So we'll get into that a little later. So let's get started. So math achievement is actually one of the most important skills for students to learn, even more important than reading. And that's because in academics, they have found that in order to even boost reading scores, math scores coming up helped with reading scores. So they actually looked at 32 states plus the District of Columbia, and they found that students who were doing better in math did better in reading and also did better in other subject matters. They also found that students who got to a higher level of mathematics did better financially. So if we can get students up into higher level mathematics, being algebra, geometry, trig, and calculus, the better that they will be with their finances, which means they can do better off financially. So that's why math is so important. The other thing with regards to mathematics is that all of STEM is actually the foundation to it or the roots of it is mathematics. If you want students to get into the STEM careers and expanding their, uh, their employment base when they get out of school, you really have to have a firm foundation in mathematics. So we really want to get kids interested in math so that they can get those jobs of the future in engineering, physics, robotics, chemistry, computer science, um, and a lot of the programming that will go with uh, the jobs of the future. So we wanna get that firm foundation of mathematics in. So first I wanna emphasize that not all kids are exposed to math in their homes. Some kids do not have any board games in their homes. Some kids have, don't have children's music in their homes. They don't have cards or dice. Some kids don't have Legos or building blocks in their home. And some kids don't even have been exposed to counting on their fingers. And you have to understand that not all kids have somebody in their house that likes mathematics. So when kids come to your program, a lot of them are coming in with a lack of exposure to mathematics and a different exposure than other students had. And some of it can be a negative exposure. Their parents didn't like math, their uh, family members didn't like math, or they just didn't have a lot of things to play around in their house that were math-based. So when they're coming into your program, it's very important that we give them that opportunity to be exposed in math in very positive ways. So one of the things we are doing is we want to move from mathematics being controlled where we are placing something down in front of them and we want them to get an answer to that specific question to being something that's more cooperative. And doing that is going to take away that anxiety and fear for students when they don't, not all the pressure for the right answer is on them, but they can get it through a cooperative group. And we wanna go from the more drill and worksheet based to more exploring of mathematics and getting them to really understand how math is applied in real world. We want to go from speed to understanding. We don't, speed isn't important. The best mathematicians in the world aren't fast at mathematics. They take time to think about it and process it. So we want to make sure that we allow kids to have that time as well. And we want to go from mistakes as errors as mistakes are opportunities. When a child makes a mistake, it gives us an opportunity to help um, for them to start learning something. If a child got it all right, at the, right off the bat, they haven't learned anything, they already knew it. So we want to make sure that we go from mistakes as errors as mistakes as opportunities of learning. 
And then from all this, we want to go from mathematics being something that might be fearful to kids to something that builds confidence for them. So we want that to provide the opportunity for confidence. And all of these come into play, in to play, actually play. When students are exposed to math in a playful way, they are going to be able to make connections better. They are seeing how math is applied. So they're starting to see what happens here can happen over there and they start to make those connections. It also takes things from short-term memory into long-term memory. So you have to remember that in order for a memory to take effect, there has to be an emotion often attached to it. Like, I'm sure you have the same with me, this COVID thing has every day seeming like the last day. So I don't even remember what I did yesterday. So we want to provide opportunities that if it's fun and engaging and provides an emotional, uh, positive emotional experience, they're gonna put it into long-term memory. Negative experiences do the same thing, but not in a positive way, obviously. So we want to make sure that the mathematics is in a positive fashion. It also games help to, and play help to create quicker recall. Students see why they have to process things a little faster and they start to, um, their mind starts to work a little bit faster making those connections. So we want to make uh, those pathways in their brains going from a narrow little pathway to a roadway where they're making that connection from one to another and they're making a deep path in their mind. And it also builds confidence. Playing with something makes you feel confident. And that's what we really want to do in mathematics. And the last is that play and games also provide that social emotional development. When kids are in a group, they start to learn things like turn taking and problem solving and working together. So all of those things come into play and that social emotional development starts to take, uh, to, starts to become formed. Now math, a math champion is somebody who reacts positively to math somebody who uh, sees mathematics and says, oh, I can do this. It also, a math champion is someone who's curious. If you're curious about something, then you're willing to try and try to figure it out. And then that leads into persistence. The, when you're curious, you become more persistent because you want to find it, an answer to the problem. So we want to create those math champion attributes in kids as well as in adults. So attitude is everything. And I'm not talking just the, the student's attitude. I'm talking about the educator's attitude as well. So oftentimes I am, have people come up to me saying, oh, I don't like math. Oh, I was never good at math. I'm not a math person. And if they are saying this to students, you're getting students to see that math isn't that important. If I told you, oh, I don't like broccoli. Broccoli's yucky, broccoli's not that great. It's not a good vegetable. It's less likely that that child will taste broccoli and want to try broccoli. And even if they taste it and they think it tastes good, they're gonna question themselves on why they must be wrong. So make sure when you're talking about math that you're positive about it. Now, you have to get this concept uh, learned is that you don't have to have the answers. You don't have to be an Einstein. You don't have to be able to come up with the answers right away. That's not your job. The job is for the student to come up with the answer. So what we need the educators to be is more of a cheerleader, cheering them on, telling them how they can do it, giving them strategies to get there to solve the problems. And we want them to work it out while we're encouraging them. If we are just there with the answers, they've learned nothing. We want to be able to encourage them to find the answers. So to become a math champion, as we stated before, accept that mistakes are good, accept that speed is not important, want to make math fun, and that's it. And we can become math champions. So one of the things I often tell educators is have a mathematician that you know, just some information about a mathematician in history that you can bring up with kids so that they start to feel like they know a mathematician too. 
And one of the ones I bring up is Katherine Johnson. She was in the movie uh, Hidden Figures and is a well-known uh, uh, African-American woman who worked for NASA and helped with the, um, the landing of a space shuttle. So she is an important figure and I, she just died recently this last year and she's gonna have a building named after her at NASA. And she's a great um, person to characterize because they might have some familiarity with the story, uh, which is a great movie if you haven't seen it. But so they might have familiarity with her, but there's lots of other mathematicians out there. Einstein, there's Newton, there's, uh, Lovelace, Ida Lovelace. There's lots of them out there that you can help make connections with with your students. And next is I tell educators to have a favorite number. So you have a favorite number that you want to come up or, you know, as kids often have got a favorite number, it's going to show up more often. That's not likely. It's just one of those probability things, but have a favorite number that you can share with kids and why it's your favorite. Mine happens to be four and it's because I had uh, I like animals and animals have four legs. It's really that simple. And know a math riddle or joke that you can tell students so it kind of breaks the tension and they see that math can be fun and funny. So my joke is, why did the obtuse angle go to the beach? Any guesses? So you have to think that what is an obtuse angle? and it's over 90 degrees. So it's, that's the answer, it's over 90 degrees, ba -ching. So yeah, so I have a little joke that you can tell kids. And then tell students how you use math every day. And we do use math every day. We use algebra every day. We do geometry every day. Um, when we're going to the grocery store and we're trying to plan our route so that we're not driving all over town, we're using um, geometrical ideas. When we're at the grocery store and we're comparing prices, we're using algebraic ideas. So talk to your kids about math and how you use math every single day. And then have a favorite game that you can play with kids and you can pull out and do with them. And we're gonna show you a few games that you can do with kids, but have a favorite game. So, to start off with, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Mango Math and what I, I do is, um, as I said, I have a master's degree in curriculum instruction and I actually have just a gift for writing games, uh, math concepts into games. And I came up with my own company, which is called Mango, which is an acronym for the different math strands. So we have measurement, algebraic thinking, number sense, geometry, and the O is for odds and order, which is actually really probability and data, but I had to get a little O in there. So um, Mango Math is about these different math strands, which are the, the main math strands of mathematics. And then I created this math kit, which has all the supplies in there for the kids to do the games. They just pull them out and use them and they are engaging and trying to get kids exposed to these different math, math concepts. Now, all of that helps with problem solving. Games are a great way to help kids learn problem solving. And there's different problem solving strategies. And I'm gonna show you some games that I've come up with that kids um, are learning problem solving as well as learning mathematical concepts, be it um, algebraic thinking or number sense or any of those other math strands. So the first game is called Crack the Code. And I've kind of taken lessons out of all my kits for each different grade level that had this theme of cracking a code. So I always liked um, kind of detective type things, trying to figure some problem out. And so I kind of went in that idea with a lot of the lessons in the kits. And so this one is crack the code. So they're trying to figure out how to open up the little piggy bank. And they're given a clue in which the sum of the combination is four. So we know the sum is four and there are three numbers in the combination. None of the numbers are the same and the smallest number is the last number. So I want kids to take in that information. I want them to work as a group because when they're talking in a group, they're going to start collaborating and communicating together, which helps to build up those um, math skills that we so need kids to develop and those life 21st century skills. 
And so they're going to talk about amongst themselves and they're going to start to come up with what the combinations will be. And this one's a little tricky because there's a zero in it. And some kids forget that a zero is a placeholder and can be put in there also. So this is looking at what are the different ways we can make the code. And we have three, one, zero, all equals four. And we also have one, three, zero equals four. So it's getting the students to understand that numbers can be put in any order to come up with a sum. So there's lots of different learning on this one. And they can see if there's any other ways they can do this. Um, they'll, I'm sure some of the kids will rotate other numbers like try to do two, two and zero, but that doesn't meet the criteria in the, um, the directions. So they can have those conversations, which are great conversations to have. So another one, it's another example. The sum of the combination is 10. There are three numbers in the combination. Two of the numbers are the same. The numbers that are the same are side by side. So there's a lot of information there. There's a lot of words in there that they need to develop in order to become good mathematicians. And so they can start talking to each other and figuring out what these words mean and what the numbers can possibly be. So they could have a five, five and a zero. They can have a zero, five, five. They can have a four, four, two. I have a four, three, three. They could also have a two, four, four or a three, three, four. So there's different ways that they can come up with that combination. And that's the idea is that I want them to think of all the different ways that you can make that sum of 10 out of three numbers and meeting the criteria on the card. So then that was a, a first, second grade level activity. This next one is into your second and third grade activities. Uh, we want kids to understand place value as well. So it's the same idea. Yeah, the digits in the number are five, two, two, and three. None of the digits are in the correct order. So they're, once again, they're giving clues. They can talk about it amongst themselves. They can place the numbers up there so that they have something to work with and move around. Sometimes I use uh, decks of cards because they have all the numbers in there four times. So you can move, the kids can move around the deck of cards. So they're going to, uh, Think about what goes, the next one is digits in the tens place is two less than the digits in the hundreds place. So they've got to look at these digits and try to determine what number could go in the tens place, what number in the hundreds place, what number is two, diff there's a difference of two between them. And you don't want to get that mixed up with the number two. So there's lots of things in this problem that gets kids thinking um, and processing a lot of information. So as uh, you see the threes in the tens place because the digit in the tens place is two less than the number in the hundreds place. So they've got that down. And then the next card says the digits in the thousands place and the ones place are even. They can have a discussion on what does even mean. It means they're the same. So they can put the two in the two in the right spots. So these uh, type of cards are easy to create. You just first come up with a number off your head and then you come up with some clues for them to use. And the next one is the same idea, another code that they're cracking. This one gets a little more detailed and gets into a lot more logic. So this one's for your upper grades. Um, and we have to start looking at what strategies we can use. There's different strategies for problem solving. There's guess and check, there's work backwards, there's make a list. All those are different ways that you can solve um, this particular problem. There's uh, seven or eight different problem solving strategies. These are just three of them that could be used in this um, problem alone. So they, you give the students this problem, you have them reading through the clues once again and trying to come up with what's the best way to solve this particular uh, code. So I looked at it and I thought, well, I'm going to go with the first or the uh, second to the last clue. Nothing is correct. So that's going to be telling me that none of these numbers are in the code. So I can cross them out there and I can cross them off anywhere else I see them because none of those numbers are in the code. And then I'm going to look at that. So now I have that last row that says one digit not in the correct place. 
I have a zero. So I know that zero has to be correct because the other two numbers were crossed out. So I know I have a zero. And I can make some lines on a piece of paper to um, take a deck of cards if I want to on this as well and have the cards be in place uh, for solving this problem. So I know that there's going to be a zero in there. I just don't know what place that zero goes into yet. So then I'm looking at what's another clue I can look at. And I see that there's a zero in that middle uh, row. And so I know that that zero has to be a correct number there. And it says two digits not in the correct place. So I know that the zero is not in the correct place there. So it can't be in the ones place. It can't be in the tens place. So it must be in that hundreds place. So I know a zero goes there. And then I know two of those other numbers are correct. I just don't know which one of the two is correct. So I'm gonna keep going and looking at clues. And then I'm gonna to go to that top one because it says one digit is correct in the correct place. So I know that it cannot be the six because that zero is already in that hundreds place. So the one digit in, is correct in the correct place. It cannot be the six because I have a zero already there. But if you're working with kids, you want them to have this discussion amongst themselves. And so I now know I have that two. And I know that that two is in the correct place because of the clue. So now I have a zero and I have a two and I know I can't have a six. So there's six is not an option. I could cross that out of all of those as well which I don't think I did in this one. So then I'm left with the four and the five. And I have one clue left and it says one digit is one digit not in the correct place. So it means that I have one digit that's correct there but not in the correct place. So I have to see that five is not in the correct place. Four, if I used four, it would be in the correct place. So it's got to be the number five. So as you can see, that one's a little bit more challenging. There's a lot more thought process in it. And we're still working on place value. We're looking at critical thinking. And so kids can start to work together in a group and start processing this out and figuring out the answer. And then another example going up into upper grades. Again, this is more for fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth graders when we're looking at balanced equations, but we want it on one side to be balanced on another side. And you can use uh, pattern block shapes or any um, geometrical shapes. And I like to use them at first because I think kids get a better idea and not so stressed out about a number if you're using objects. So on this one, we're trying to figure out what that question mark represents. And so we're going to look at each balance uh, scale on there. And as you can see on the first one, the square is equal to the rhombus and the circle. So I can look down on that middle scale and I see that I have a rhombus and a circle side by side. And I know that's equal to a square. So I know I have now, I have a square there and two circles and then an oval and one circle. Well, in algebraic reasoning, if I to balance the scale, I can take things off of both sides as long as they still balance. So I'm going to take the small circle off of both sides and it's still balanced. So then I have a square and a circle equaling an oval. So then that means two ovals is the same as a square and a circle or a circle and square. Any way that that's set up would balance out that side of the equation. So as kids are working through this, I can have them understanding balanced scales without ever using numbers. And then I can replace with numbers and get them to understand how it all works out algebraically. So they're all fun activities all of them engaging with kids, they're playing around, they're asking questions, they're problem solving, and they're doing this one, algebraic reasoning, the others were number sense. Uh, and so we're all doing really core mathematics and they're getting a firm understanding of mathematics. 
So you can follow me on any of the social media sites. We're on Facebook, uh, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, and I don't know if the other oh, and LinkedIn. And you can check out those sites. It's all at Mango Math on all of them. And you can check out our website where we have kits that we sell. There's 20 lessons per grade level. They meet the Common Core and NCTM standards. So you can check those out and we have them in full sets. So you can have one of each grade level or you can buy it specific for your grade level. If you have questions and you have students who are not at grade level, please give, give me a contact and I can uh, talk you through that. Uh, know that the grade level on any of these is just on the outside of the box and not on the lessons themselves because I don't want to deter kids from playing any of these games. So thank you so much. I appreciate you watching this video. If you have any questions, you can contact me at mary at mangomath.com. Thank you so much.